I'm Wes Wenham. Uh, I'm going to read my really long talk, talk title because I like the long, long talk titles of uh, Pen testing the developer interview, tax and ace tech interviews, and defenses that build better teams. Um, so who has heard of the book Thinking Fast and Slow? A few people. So this is um, this is kind of a psychology book um, written by a Nobel Prize winner. The system, the um, taxonomy he puts forth is you have a system one, you probably heard about it on the internet somewhere. You have system one, this is like your really fast thinking brain. It's like the oldest brain. If you've ever driven somewhere and you you end up in the, like at work and you don't remember how you got there, that's because system one was driving your car. It's really fast, but it's really biased and wrong. Like if you put it in the wrong situation, it'll come out with the wrong answer. System two is your like logical, rational brain. We kind of think that we're, we're operating in most of the time, but we're not. Um, so that's the framework I'm gonna kind of use for this talk around cognitive biases and attacking the interview. Uh, before I start, favor to ask, I'm gonna give this a version of this talk again, so I'd really appreciate any feedback. So if you like a part, don't like a part, think something could be better, tweet at me, email me, uh, I would really appreciate your feedback. All right. So who am I? Uh, I spent the last 10 years as head of engineering at a startup here, uh, actually in Carmel, uh, called Policy Staff. So hiring was the most important. Oh, I should use the mic more. I can hear myself much better. Okay, sorry about that. Now I will talk in the mic. Uh, so hiring was the most important part of my job, but it was really, really hard to find great engineers. Um, I hired dozens of engineers, or dozens of interns, eight engineers, and a bunch of other folks, and I screwed up a lot. I made mistakes. And I learned uh, quite a bit from those mistakes. So that's kind of why I'm passionate about this topic. Um, what really kicked off the most recent passion about hiring is I, a couple summers ago, at the end of the summer, I hired an intern. He was awesome. We were in a meeting talking about how great he was. He pushed 10 things to production. It was like having a junior engineer. And then the engineering manager said, we got lucky with Stefan. And I'm like, what do you mean? Uh, we had screened his resume out. So the best intern I've had in 10 years, I tried not to hire. I just got lucky. I screened his resume out. I ranked him third on a, a, some other list. And because of the ex way the extern program works, I got lucky and got a great, uh, great intern that really fit with my team. And that sent me down this journey of like, how can I not rely on getting lucky again? So and then I uh, started the company focused on developer hiring. That was kind of the, 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 the path. So today. Uh, we're going to be the red team. We're going to use cognitive biases and social engineering to attack the developer in interview. So a red team is this concept of you want to have someone to attack your code, attack your infrastructure, and that simulates in the real world someone attacking you. Um, so if you're interviewing, if you're going to be in an interview, uh, you're going to be the attacker. Uh, if you're running an interview, you're going to be the defender. That's kind of our, our mental model for tonight. I'm going to try to convince you that our gut feel is not very good when it comes to interviewing. Um, and then I'm going to pick the most common bias-causing heuristic, and we're going to use that to attack the interview at each common stage of the interview process. So why this kind of computer security metaphor? So imagine you had a Windows 95 PC and you plugged it into the internet. What would immediately happen? Nothing. Nothing. Ah, uh, true question. What what if it had what if you what if you downloaded the driver? Okay, you have a you have a disk, I think, and you put the drivers in and then you stick in the internet. Yeah. Then what happens? Yeah. Very few websites True. What else would happen? I think your computer would get owned almost immediately. Like you've got no firewall if you're plugged directly in your view. Uh, look directly into the internet, you would get owned. Someone would control your computer. Um, this is kind of what happens in our modern interview process, right? So we were, we, our brains evolved, our instincts evolved, our heuristics and system one evolved uh, in small tribes where we knew everybody. We knew everybody our entire life, and that's our Windows 95 brain. And now. We're doing this thing where we meet people one-on-one -on -one for short periods and have to make really important judgments about them using that brain that's geared for you know Windows 95 era stuff. So the model is how do we and we can't upgrade our brain. 
that hardware is not patchable. Um, so how do we protect this thing? How do we protect ourselves from these modern scenarios, the, the job of the So we're going to build some firewalls and protections around our brain. Um, so before we do talk about hiring bias, uh, let's talk about what the goal of hiring process is. What is the goal of hiring process? Yes, Miles. Build an awesome team. Build an awesome team. That is a really, that's a really good answer. Does anyone have another answer? Yeah. Filling a specific role. Filling a specific role. That's a good one. A common, a common answer might be to hire the best person. That's one that, if, if I, when I ask this question, that's the answer I usually get. Uh, I think build an awesome team is is what I, the actual goal of hiring. And the idea here is if. Uh, if the five best, I hate sports analogies, but I'm using them. If you, the five best uh, soccer players in the world are all goalkeepers, and you have the opportunity to hire them on your team, it would be really dumb to have five goalkeepers on your soccer team, because you can only play one. Uh, so if your goal was hire the best person, that might lead you to hire those, you know, goalkeeper number three that you don't need. Um, so our goal is to build the best team, build an awesome team. All right, I'm going to skip over this bit. Daniel Kahneman is awesome. If you read the book, you will understand that. He did some cool Israeli military hiring stuff where he fixed the process from being mostly random to actually being good. Um, and he did it when he was like 22. And pretty cool. Uh, so we're going to talk about heuristics. I use that word a couple times. When I talk about a heuristic, I just mean a rule of thumb. This is like a quick decision making uh, like a shortcut. Um, so heuristics mostly evolved, they're mostly system one, they mostly match our evolutionary environment, and they're broken in certain ways, which I'm about to show you. So, this is an interactive exercise, I want everyone to like think of an answer. A bat and ball cost $1.10 in total, the bat costs $1 more than the ball, how much does the ball cost? How many cents does the ball cost? I'm give everyone a second. Rose, I'm like standing right in front of the slide. All right. So who said, who thought 10 cents? You don't have to raise your hand. I'm going to put you on the spot. So most people answer this 10 cents. That is the intuitive answer. So let's take a second to do the math. If the ball costs 10 cents, uh, the bat would cost $1.10. Our total is now $1.20. 10 cents is the wrong answer that comes really fast, is really intuitive, and it's wrong. So this is an example of a heuristic um, where we're wrong. Let's do another one. This is totally not an optical illusion. Just kidding, it is. So these look like spirals, right? And there, there are lots of really good optical illusions. If anyone sees one they like, I'd love for you to send it to me because I love collecting these. These look like they're spiraling in, but they're not. They're concentric circles. If you try to follow one around with your eye, it'll kind of like slide off and you're like, oh, back where I was. So this is an example where stuff like this doesn't exist in nature. This is not a thing our brain evolved to capture. So you could say it's a bug, but really our, our brain is doing its job, which is not to be 100% correct. It's to get the right answer using the right amount of energy in the right scenarios. So if I, if I have not convinced you by now uh, that you have cognitive biases and sometimes your gut, your, your gut is wrong, that's awesome because you're going to be super easy to attack when we go to the rest of the uh, rest of the presentation. All right, Linda is 31 years old, single, outspoken, and very bright. She majored in philosophy. As a student, she was deeply concerned with issues of discrimination and social justice, and also participated in the anti-nuclear demonstrations. Which is more probable? One, Linda is a bank teller. Two. Linda is a bank teller and is active in the feminist movement. So, if you give this quiz to anyone walking around the street, somewhere around 80% of people will say two. Two is more likely. Yeah, she's, you know, she was in an anti-nuclear demonstration. She's probably active in the feminist movement. But because we kind of deal with set theory and stuff, we probably realize that just it doesn't make sense. Like. Everyone who is a bank teller and is in the feminist movement is also a bank teller. It's impossible for this group to be bigger than that one. But our instinct is to say, well, she's active in the feminist movement. 
feminist, feminist bank teller is more salient in our minds, so we put a higher probability on it. So 80% of people are, are wrong, just like we were. Most people are wrong in that bat and ball analogy. Most people uh, are wrong whenever they look at the spiral thing. It's really easy to be wrong here. So this is the this is the heuristic that's most exploitable during interviewing. It's the availability heuristic. Um, the feminist bank teller was more available. It was more salient in your brain. It's like easy to have a story about like you know this Linda that's a feminist bank teller that goes around doing feminist bank teller things and just like you know a bank teller. So this is what we're going to attack. This is our vector in on every step of the interview. We're going to tell stories. We're going to make it more available. Um, because the easier it is for someone to imagine something, the easier it is for them to remember it. And memory is like, you know, it's the key to most of what we're looking for here when people are making complex decisions. Uh, I like to say stories are the native compression format for the human mind. And when I say that, uh, there's a really good book I'm not going to talk about very much called Moonwalking with Einstein, um, which is an awesome title. We are really good at making uh, competitions out of everything. And we make memory competitions. This is a thing that exists, and it's amazing. So the world record for the number of cards, normal playing cards in random order, that someone has memorized in an hour is like 2,000 cards. It's 1,924 cards. I don't think I get more than like seven cards. So are these people like crazy, superhuman, you know, whatever freaks? No. They have like a pretty simple trick. It's called a memory palace, and it just you just make a story with each of these cards. You move through physical space, you have characters, and you have a story, and our brains are just really, really good at remembering, remembering stories. We're bad at remembering random numbers, but really good at these stories. So that we're gonna create these stories when we're attacking the interview. So, our attack vector is stories. We're gonna implant these stories in the mind of the interview. Um, and the story we want to create fundamentally is we want to we want to make it easy for them to imagine a story of you as a successful coworker that's making their life easier. That's the story. That's what we want to bring over and over. So now I'm, gonna, I'm bad at pushing the button one time. So when you're making a resume, you want to be the feminist librarian, not the librarian. It's not just the facts. It's just the stories. That's how you get past a resume screen. So you want to get uh, one one example that I like is they did this study because academics love doing studies on this stuff um, because you can just send out resumes and change stuff and see what companies uh, respond to and it's really cheap. So it's like if you're oh, I got to do a study to get my PhD, people do resume studies. So there's lots of cool stuff if you want to uh, look at. They did one resume study. They gave people a second STEM degree. So like I've got you know computer science and physics or I've got software engineering and you know whatever. They took that group versus uh, a group where they changed non-action verbs to action verbs. So it would be like, built this project, or uh, a drove goal to completion, those sort of like action words. Which do you think made a bigger impact, changing from passive to action verbs, or from one degree to two STEM degrees? One of these things like takes two or three years of your life, and the other one takes like five minutes of someone saying, hey, your resume's bad. This one has twice the impact. Doing action verbs, it's twice the impact on pass-through than getting a second degree. It's crazy. This stuff like makes a big difference. So you want to be the feminist librarian. And the way you do that, use a back action verb. Every, anytime you talk about something you did, use an action verb, um, make it into a story. And I'm going to talk about what makes a story in the next slide. Um, but a way to check this is for each thing on your resume, you go through and give it to a friend and have them tell you the story. They're going to have to add a lot of words and context, and if they can't tell you a story, you need to rewrite that bullet point. Um, and if, if it's your mom, even better. Or maybe your mom is, uh, is a software engineer, but someone you know in your life that is, uh, is not technical. So that's how we attack them. We attack with stories at the resume. Um, how do we defend against this? Uh, we use a checklist. It's pretty boring. We say, what are the things that matter for this position? Okay, maybe they want to use these technologies. They worked in this kind of team. Um, they talk about you know, whatever those things are, whatever you want for that goal. You write them down, 
you have a checklist. Here are the nine things we're looking for. You assign points to them. This is worth one, this is worth three, this is worth two. And then you go through the resume and give points. You will inoculate yourself against this storytelling uh, like delivery vehicle, this vulnerability you have in your brain. It's super, it's kind of boring, um, but it works much better. And it also means that you can, uh, you can scale this process. You can build that algorithm and then give it to someone else and have them help you do resume screening. Which is kind of nice. Uh, I personally think resume screening is mostly screening for who doesn't have a friend that's good at resume building that they can ask. That's really what you're screening out because I'm pretty confident I could take almost anybody's resume, change it, and get them past the resume screen. Like it's just kind of a game you have to be able to play. So I, I don't have a high opinion of resume screening. Now to the now to the phone screen. We're not talking about stories yet. I lied. We're talking about stories after this one. Um, so on the phone screen, um, this is mostly, this is like usually the strongest gut feel. Uh, I've, I've talked to 30 hiring managers and, and phones and recruiters, and the most consistent uh, thing that, that, that gets you to the next step is confidence and enthusiasm. I hate that that is the thing that matters most on the phone screen, but it is. And it's really easy to attack. So if you want to attack confidence and enthusiasm, uh, Picture this. Picture the person on the phone screen. The thing that will get you past the phone screen is them believing that uh, you're someone that will make their workday better, that will be a good colleague. What is the best colleague, or one of the best colleagues, the most consistently good colleague in someone's mind? You might say, well, it depends on the team and the circumstances. Nope, it doesn't. You want to be a clone of that person who is more excited and more confident and will do the work that person doesn't want to do. If you're that person, you will get past every phone screen. That's like that's like the hack. You know, there's other ways to get past phone screens, but that's that that will consistently work. Um, so here's some like specific tips. You want to be excited. How do you fake excitement? You know, you, you if you're doing ten phone screens, a lot of companies you might actually be excited, but it's tough to get excited about a phone screen itself. You might be excited about the job, uh, but you're also nervous. How do you how do you project excitement? Uh, you smile when you talk. It actually changes. Like there are reasons. There's research. People can hear tone of voice changes if you're smiling when you talk. So the way to do this, uh, if, if you if you can just if you're good at smiling when you talk, you can just think about it and smile when you talk, and it's okay. Some people will put a mirror in front of them when they're on the phone, and they that'll like project them. Hey, you're, you're not smiling, or me isn't smiling. Uh, it's really important. Another thing you can do is just do jumping jacks, do something to get your blood uh, worked up before the phone call. It sounds stupid, but it works. Um, next step is confidence, right? How do I project confidence to attack this uh, availability heuristic? Uh, it's your voice. So it's having a big voice. It's not talking softly, which sucks, because some people are soft talk talkers and doesn't mean they're not good engineers. Um, and it's asking questions. Asking questions about a question, that's a confidence move for some reason. Uh, it's also a good way to stall. So if someone asks you a question and you need time to think, you can either ask them a question about the question, or you can say, that's a good question. Hmm. You just buy yourself like five seconds in a confident way, and you've complimented the interviewer. It, it totally works. It works on me. I've, I've in retrospect, noticed it happening. Like it's, a, it's kind of a superpower for phone screens. Um, you also want to mirror talking speed. Like I'm talking pretty fast. If you're on the phone screen with me right now, you should talk fast, and we would get excited together. And like I would be like, man, this 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 person is awesome. If your interviewer is talking slow, you want to slow it down, be really deliberate about your speech, and they will like you more. It's weird. It's a human psychology thing. It's it's like Windows 95 uh, embedded uh, stuff we have here. Um, and as far as asking questions, you can have a few reusable questions. What's your what's an average day look like? What's your best day look like? You know, what's your worst day? Look? There's like some stock questions you can just always have because if you don't ask a question, you will get failed by a internal group. That's like a almost everyone brought that up. Have a question. It's silly, but that's a thing that really matters. Um, and then try to have at least one specific question that you can usually get from the job description. I see you're on Rails five. How did the upgrade go? Just something to show a little bit of interest. Um, 
and then you're going to tell stories. I'm going to talk a little bit about this in the next slide, but you want to tell stories uh, about things that they would want a teammate to do. All right, so how do we defend against this? How do we defend against this, uh, this excited clone of ourselves that's mirroring? Uh, one way is to ask the same questions of everyone. So if you minimize the like random variance, you'll be able to, uh, uh, you will be able to standardize things and have an easier comparison across people. So ask the same questions. You can ask follow-up questions within that, but at least ask the same broad questions. And then you score each question individually. You know, don't you don't have to overcomplicate it. A one to three scale is actually pretty good. Um, and then you need to help train yourself. Uh, what's an okay, bad? What's a bad, okay, good question? And the best way to do this is you can either record your next phone screen or you can just write out someone's answer, just a fake answer. Say, this is a bad answer, this is an okay answer, this is a good, can uh, good answer. And if you haven't done a phone screen in a while, you can read that up and that'll help you be consistent and help you kind of like not fall into that narrative fallacy. Or just don't rely on phone screens. That's kind of my belief is that uh, they're not super predictive. I did a bunch of fiddling around with phone screens, doing things before after phone screens. Uh, and I found them to be very unpredictive outside of people who are such assholes that they can't even hide their assholeness in scheduling the interview or having a phone screen. That's pretty predictive. Um, and that's, that's 5 to 10 percent of people in my experience, which is like kind of embarrassingly high, but that's, that's a thing. Like people that would uh, say mean things to the recruiter that was scheduling their interview if there was like a minor mistake or something that was unclear. Like, these people exist. All right, we're going to talk about stories. I, I've talked about stories a lot, a lot, so how do we build a good story? Um, it needs four things. It needs the context, which means a when and a where. Yes, it needs the context of the when and the where. It needs a challenge, which is a problem or an opportunity. Um, it needs a way you address that challenge. You overcame it. You, had a, you resolved the conflict. And then it needs an outcome. Um, if you don't have any of these four things, you are not telling a story. Most of my stories are not stories because I'm a bad storyteller, so I have to like be very explicit about this. Some people are great storytellers naturally. Uh, one tip for like your story needs a win. If you don't create a win in your scenario, you activate a different part of your brain than if you tell the same story without a win, which is, uh, which is kind of crazy, um, but it, it makes a difference. It makes a difference how how your story is, is processed. Um, there's a book called Selling with a Story that I would recommend if you care about this, if this is something that uh, you want to learn more about. It's actually, it's really good. It's really practical. It tells you, like, gives you lots of examples of good stories, bad stories, how to turn a bad story into a good story. It's a, I've read like six story books, and this is by far the best one. Um, so the way you want to, so you, you know, now we know what a good story is, so how do we create the stories we need for the internet? Create a Google Doc or a Word Doc. You don't need, if there are 70 interview questions, like you Google common interview questions, um, you don't need a story for each question. You need like five to 10 stories, and you can reuse the same story for different questions. That's kind of the trick. So have a few polished stories that you can reuse for different contexts, um, because they're gonna be a lot of tell me about a time questions. And you go, well, one time, and you can reuse them, because people, it's not like one interviewer is gonna ask you seven questions, 70 questions. One of you is going to ask you six questions and use your six stories. Um, and they're polished and they're impressed and you're like sticking in their brain. Um, and then you can kind of make sure that you have those four story components. Let's talk about take home tests. Uh, so take home tests are a double edged sword. They're, they're both good and bad. There are really bad uh, take home tests out there that are kind of, I think, are kind of ex exploitative. You know, they expect 20 to 30 hours of work. Uh, I don't think that's fair for an interview. Um, but I do think take-home tests let better uh, better engineers in the context show that they're a better fit um, versus totally being vulnerable to this confidence excitement thing that we've been talking about. So I, I have mixed opinions on that. So how do we attack the take-home test? Most companies don't use a rubric because the rubrics are really hard to create. So what they, what the person that's looking at the take-home test does is they answer the question, is this like my work? That's the easiest question to answer, and that's what most people do. And if it's like my work, I'm going to say, yeah, thumbs up. If it's not my, like my work, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trend towards thumb down. So that means 
you can find out uh, you can find out things about the company that'll make a big difference that are actually easy. What unit test framework do they use? You should use the same one. Uh, what kind of tools do they use? Use the same tools. Um, how do they do documentation? Go find their open source projects. You can kind of find this information. You can do 10 minutes of research. Uh, use one of those tools, and it makes a big difference in how you proceed when someone's looking at a take-home test. Just because Windows 95 uh, brain hardware. If it's an untimed take-home test, you should plan to spend three to five times as much on it. Uh, so if it's this test was designed for two hours, you uh, to have a chance of succeeding, you probably need to spend six to ten hours. Just kind of know that, plan for it. Um, that's that's just mostly how it works. If there's no way to enforce a time limit, but what do you do with that extra time? You do not build extra stuff. You do not extend the product to do stuff that wasn't in the specs. You just polish, polish, polish. Write your code, walk away, come back, refactor, fix your variable names, do your own pull request review, um, and you can pass a take-home test that you otherwise would have not passed. I wouldn't, I wouldn't lie about any of this stuff. I, I would not lie about any of this. I'm not, I'm not proposing that. I'm proposing that we, uh, we present ourselves in this broken system as, in the best way possible. So how do we defend against this? We time box exercise. The easiest way to do this is uh, if you want a two-hour exercise, I'm going to, okay, you want to take it at Saturday at 7 a.m.? I'm going to email you at Saturday at 7 a.m. I can schedule an email. There's lots of tools for that. And then you set the expectation. They email it back when they're done. Maybe they email it back at 9.30 a.m. It's not a big deal. Um, but you at least have some kind of balance on the exercise. Uh, and you should have them work on the existing projects, like take an open source project, take an internal piece of a project, build a toy project, because that constrains the variance. It makes it a lot easier to do apples to apples comparisons between work samples. If you give someone a one pager and say, like, solve this problem, you can get some cool stuff. But how do you compare that cool stuff to that cool stuff? What you end up doing, most work sample, most take home tests are here's a broad problem, uh, it's untimed, and what you end up measuring, which is for better or worse, is enthusiasm and that candidate's time, their free time. So uh, do you want to be able to hire a single mom uh, who already has a job? If the answer is yes, you want to consider your time. Because um, sometimes you know, a 22-year-old uh, single person that's in between jobs is going to commit a lot to your blank, open-ended work take-on test. And it's going to be tough to compare that to someone who really did spend two hours and did like a really good job in that two hours. Um, always have at least two graders. So I have two people that grade it independently, don't talk to each other, and then reveal their grade. And if they disagree, figure it out. Uh, that's, that's really important because I have regraded my own, uh, something I've graded in the past to test myself and gotten wildly different results based on mood and just, I don't know what, random variation. So at least two graders and blind com comparison makes a big difference. Bonus points for an objective rubric. It's like, they wrote this test. This thing worked. They refactored this function, but those take a long time. Um, so it's something to work to work towards. All right. This presentation has been for an attacker or an interviewer um, that's interviewing during the world today. And I think it sucks that most of these attacks exist. It really sucks that they work. Um, they work on my interviews. They work on most interviews out in the wild. Uh, so I would like to challenge this group to make the world a little bit better. Um, we don't want to give advantages to the overconfident, uh, storytelling, exaggerating engineer. That's not who we want on our teams. We want the engineers that are good teammates, that are honest about what they did, and maybe they're spending their time learning a new, uh, learning a new library, or just um, uh, that, that's the kind of person on their team, and that's not what our interviews today are designed to uh, to reward. So we want to build a firewall of tools, training, and process. Um, that's how we fix this problem, and we want to make interviewing better for everyone. So uh, I work at a company called Woven, so it's Kyle. We care a lot about developer hiring. We have a product. It's probably not a product for most of the people in the room, but we love talking about developer hiring. If you care about any of this stuff, just want to like bounce ideas, uh, please talk to either of us, because we really want to make, we want to participate with all of you in making developer hiring better for everyone. Thank you. Anyone have a question? Miles. I, I have two questions that I would like to ask at the same time. All right. You can decide. 
whether it's actually one question. Okay. Uh, so on the, the take home test mm -hmm. uh, topic, um, have you, uh, how do you feel about or have you seen uh, people pay for the interviewee to take the take home test? And uh, the second, I guess, part of that question is um, working towards that time box idea. How, what do you think of the idea of paying hourly? Um, so the first question on paying for take-home tests, yes, it is not the norm, but it's not uncommon. Uh, so at, at policy stat, I paid for one of our take-home tests, but not the other ones. My rule of thumb for that, and there are people who disagree, is if the candidate could have any could could have any inkling that this might be work that you could use, turn around and use, you should pay for it. I think that's only fair. And if you can pay for pay for it anyway, that's probably better. It seems it seems fair. Uh, if in, in our scenario we had a it was a marketing hire and we couldn't I couldn't think of an exercise that would be predictive of the work without using some of our real details. So it's like we're going to pay for that work, we're going to throw it away, but it's fair. Um, it's 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 not it's not common to pay for take home tests though. As far as hourly rate, uh, what what is your goal with the hourly rate? Um, well, if you're going to pay. Also worried about time boxing. Uh, basically, what happened is my brain went, "Oh, what if you used a tool like Harvest, for instance, to go track the time, um, as opposed to email timestamps or that sort of mm -hmm. thing, um, to both track the time and ultimately pay out?" Uh, so the that doesn't doesn't sound bad anyway. I think the incentives that creates are to spend more time. So you got to be aware of those incentives you want to create. Um, and also, I, I've, I'm familiar with several companies like Stack Overflow does this. They have a fixed cost pay for their take home test. Um, but most of the candidates I talked to spent much more time than that. And they weren't. And, and the instructions are like, we will pay more if you spend more time. But what are your incentives here? You're, you're talking about a you know, really well, a job that you're excited about that's going to pay hundreds of thousand dollars over years or like a small hourly rate. So your incentives are probably not to ask for that money. So I don't think it's a good tool to uh, enforce a time box. But it's, it's, you know, it's fair to pay people for their time. That was a wishy-washy answer. That was a good question. Thank you, Lance. Yes? I'm doing jumping jacks to project confidence. It's working. Yeah, it's, it works really good. <laughs> Um, so let's say hypothetically that um, you're hiring for uh, a developer, um, a group of developers, and let's say that uh, developing is a, an uber competitive job market, and uh, developers are super expensive uh, on a year-to-year -year basis. Yep. So your company says, okay, in order to maintain our progress, let's uh, look for possibly outside of the country we can find some developers. Yep. Not only developers, let's hire a team. Um, do you have any suggestions on how you can use uh, these tactics from a uh, hiring perspective when looking to hire other countries? Do we think, so are we hiring remote folks individually to be a remote team, or are we hiring like an existing team, like a consultant saying, like, we want your team? Uh, it's either better. Uh, so uh, how you do the interview would be different. I don't know if there's one that's better. I think there's okay. trade-offs. If, if you're letting me, uh, you know, uh, drive the conversation, I'd say hiring a team. So that'd be the uh, better solution because then you have to manage. Yep. Uh, for well, you have to manage the people manage. That's the promise, right? Is that you don't have to manage. Um, so the, the first scenario where you have like a bunch of individuals, all of this just applies. You just do it remote. It works actually really well. So all of these things, the uh, the better your selection is, the more gains you get based on the size of the top of your funnel. If you're hiring remote, your top of the funnel is way bigger. Um, so policy stat, I would get 150 Python engineer applications in a month. Locally, I got seven, seven to 15, depending on how good a job I did in meetups. So it's like, orders of magnitude different. So like if you have really good selection criteria, you can turn those 150 into like someone that's exactly the right fit for you. If you're hiring a consulting group, 
hiring consultants is kind of hard. I think there are lots of consultants in the room. It's like I don't. I'm not really looking to be, you know, tested. So I'm not sure if people would agree to like run through this test work. Um, generally, if you can get a test project, some kind of short-term thing that lets both people walk away after it doesn't work, that kind of functions like the take-home test. Um, especially if it's like a self-contained project that you kind of understand what the scope would be. I would even consider redoing work you've already done so that you kind of know, this is what my team did. Is it worth paying $5,000 to, uh, to ensure that the next $100,000 we spent is well spent? It might be. Um, and you're going to learn a lot more from seeing something you've already done. I don't know if that's, that's helpful. I would, I would do as much contingent work as possible to learn before committing to a long term. Yeah, I guess if there's like internal, internal stuff, then yeah. Or, or it could be, you know, if, if part of your pro, if you could like pull out a part of your product and like scope it down and say like, do this thing. It took us, it took us a week. Um, it should take, you know, don't tell them how long you take. Like, fix, fix price or hourly or whatever. You learn a ton from seeing that work done. And if you do that, I'd love to hear about it. I did a little bit for one consulting project, and it was hard to the relation, the human relationship management is hard because people, consultants are used to like, you know, you know me, I'm awesome, pay me, which is a very reasonable position because some of them are awesome. Yes. How does Logan help with this problem? So, so we're focused on uh, plant. I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we do. Uh, we help design an exercise that follows some of these principles and administer it, and then do the rubric and scoring and stuff, um, and then kind of tune it as things go. So we were like one piece of this pro process, um, to, ideally towards the front of the funnel, um, and for companies that have a decent candidate flow. Like we're not a good fit. If you have if you have 20 candidates, you probably don't need Google. You need this advice, I think, but uh, you don't need us. So that's our thing. Miles again. I have, I have another question, but yeah. you, you kind of already answered it in a subsequent slide, but I, I wrote a question you were talking about uh, phone screens and, and hacking the phone screen, right? Uh, so do you use these tactics in your sales? Do I, oh, like to be good on the phone? Yeah. Yeah, I try to. I'm not, uh, so I do I, I do jumping jacks. I smile on phone calls. Um, I tell myself a story before the call, reminding myself that I, I believe in what I'm doing and that I think it'll make the person's, you know, person's life better. I definitely use that. I try, I try to use, um, I'm kind of like, uh, autistic -y, so my ability to naturally mirror is like not doesn't exist. It's like the opposite of that. So I've had to kind of consciously build that up. So I'm working on speech mirroring um, and in person, like doing the same. Uh, I, this might sound creepy, but I'm gonna say it anyway. So there's a <laughs> most people that are good with people, like if you see them in a conversation, one person crosses their legs, the other person mirrors that. It just happens. Like humans are crazy. We just do this. I don't do that. And it is kind of a detriment in relationship building, especially like sales, like first impression type situations. So I am creepily trying to mimic uh, what people that are good at this naturally do. And I, it helps. Um, it's starting to get less conscious, which is nice because it feels weird. There's a book called, creepily called, I can use it right again. Uh, how to make anyone like, like you in 90 seconds. It was, a, it was a guy who was a photographer, and one of the things with photographers is you meet a lot of new people, you have to establish a really quick rapport, you have to make them very comfortable or you won't get good pictures. So he was very conscious about this and talks through the techniques. And it's, it's a short book and it's, it's pretty good. I have way more questions about this topic, but not uh, actually use it. Uh, so we should definitely talk. I would love to talk more about this. Now everyone knows a lot more about me than I planned on sharing tonight. <laughs> Anything else?